Right. So the whole thing now will be recorded and we'll be able to make it available for people later as well. So we've got 27 participants at the moment, Roger. Hopefully we'll get some more in as we carry on as well. But um, off you go. Thank you very much, Andrew. Well, good evening, everybody. I hope you won't answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, welcome to uh, this talk. It's about my life, 46 years at sea, and uh, the title is Deep Sea Pilotage, a 25-year apprenticeship. The 25 years is before I became a deep sea pilot, because you had to be a captain before you could become a pilot. So there we are, the first slide, break some tourist trap or sleeping fishy for. Well, it could, it's both. And it's also somewhere, it may surprise you to know, that something like 50 million deadweight tons of shipping cruises off Brixham to pick up and land people like ourselves, deep sea pilots, and to transfer stores and crew and that sort of thing. And they're all, um, the ones that we get uh, on board, they're going off up the English Channel. And uh, here is the English Channel. Um, you can see up there is Brixham. That's the main UK port. Obviously, it's on in uh, sheltered anchorage down over there, sheltered port. Um, the prevailing westerly winds um, make certain that uh, we have a reasonably safe boarding. And then over here we have Cherbourg, which is a little more exposed, but it tends to be uh, these days, as far as, as far as my colleagues tell me, it's used more often because, as you can see, the shipping coming into Brixham have to come up the channel and cross to go up into the Dover Straits. And yet this one just goes straight on up into the Dover Straits because um, shipping all over the world is split, like a bit like the airlines, they have air corridors. We have um, routing systems. These were brought in in 1972 um, when there was a big uh, collision in the Dover Straits and two ships hit the wrecks and sank on top of them. So there was a pile up of about four ships and they said, we've got to do something about it. And so then they brought in the routing systems. So here we are, we're in Cherbourg actually with this one. This is a ship I went out to board with the Cherbourg pilot boat. Uh, it's doing about 25 knots. It's coming out to a ship there. It looks a bit like a bulk carrier. You think, oh yeah, well, a 32,000 ton bulk carrier perhaps. And uh, it may surprise you to see it close up. It's not. It's a tug pushing a barge. And that has come up from New Orleans with wheat, 32,000 tons of wheat, heading for um, Russia. And our job was to pilot the ship up through the Dover Straits, up to the Baltic entrance, which is where our area ends, and then she would get a Danish pilot to take her on round through to St. Petersburg, where they were going. I would go up to um, the Baltic entrance, I would come off at Skagen, which is the north point of uh, Denmark. I would then fly home, and then about three or four weeks later, when she was ready to come out again, I would fly up to get Skagen, and water again and bring it back down to Brixham. I, very, I enjoyed doing this ship. I was um, choice pilot for it. And in latter years, I went off to the USA and stayed with the, uh, the captain and uh, also the cook became a, a friend of ours. So we had some lovely holidays in Tampa with them. But it all started here. And this is Panath naturally by the sea. I was born and raised in Banath. Some people when they look at my career say I've probably launched in Banath. I was born in Butte House which was uh, right in the middle of the town and um, that's, it used to be a medieval farmhouse and, and uh, it, it got surrounded by Banath. It was in the Dingle area of Banath well, if you know where that is. Um, I went to school there and uh, prep school and we used to go swimming in the bars at the end of the Esplanade here. And that was our headmaster in, in Westbourne House School. He, he said, uh, right, we're overlooking the sea. Uh, you have to learn to swim, which is important. 
And so I think when I was five or five and a half, I was chucked in the swimming pool and made to um, get swimming certificates. Then when I was about seven, I think it was, um, my father took me down to Penarth Dock and there was the Palmyre, one of the flying peas, a square rig ship in Penarth Dock and I went down to look at it, stand on the dock and gaze at this amazing sailing ship and my mouth came open and I was astonished. I thought, oh God, look at that thing. And strangely enough, a few years later, she sailed from Penarth I went to the South Atlantic and was wrecked in a storm and 50 uh, German cadets lost their lives. Between uh, going to see the Palmyre and uh, a bit later on, my uncle, who was a shipping agent and uh, working for a shipping company in Cardiff, uh, Charles Willey, which is still going, uh, he was director of finance, I think, He'd been working on my father and me. I think this was a bit of a plot, this looking to see the Palmyre and then going off to see um, another ship when he said to my father, do you think Roger ought to go on another on a ship? And so they took me down to Cardiff Docks. I went on board a, a cargo ship and I spent all day on board and I had lunch with the captain and I went up on the bridge and went down the engine room and had a wonderful time. I came home armed with flags and everything else and a, a little wooden model uh, tanker carved by one of the crew so i got home and i was hanging flags out and i came around and announced to my parents i want to go to sea and i want to be a captain and this book um was my bible if you like and i poured over it day after day watching reading it especially this picture with a pilot on a bridge, and I thought, oh, that looks a good sort of life. I think I might fancy that in, in the future. So I started learning to sail and everything else, because I thought I'd better learn something about you know, going to sea. So this is uh, my first sailing thing. I got my sailing certificate when I was about 10 in Panar, in the Panar Motor Owner Sailing Club. This is a heron sailing dinghy. And actually, the, the fellow holding the, the boat there is um, a fellow called Nigel Bateman. He became a chief engineer and had to retire through um, ill health. And he's still around now, so uh, we still keep in touch. And I went on to Penarth Yacht Club and, and got another sailing sticker there. And uh, I built a canoe when I was about 12. And you couldn't keep me off the sea. I was just going up and down the, the Bristol Channel, swimming in it, rowing in it. And all sorts of things like that. And eventually, of course, I was getting educated. And we in the school one day, we are uh, we've done our GCEs and so on. And in the class, the form master was remonstrating with one of the pupils there, a fellow called Ian Bromley. And uh, he said to him, uh, you were out of school yesterday, Bromley. Where were you? And Ian Bromley said, uh, I was in London, sir, with an, having an interview with Shell Tankers for a deck apprenticeship. And I, I thought, hang on a minute. I got an interview with Shell next week. And so Ian got told off and we got told, oh, you mustn't do this. You, know, you mustn't just disappear from school. And so I got hold of Ian after that and I said, what did he ask you? You know, what, what, what? He said, you've got a bone up on the Discovery, which is across the Thames. Now, this is the um, research vessel. And so I had a good old check through the encyclopedias and everything else and got all the information about Discovery. And so went into Shell Centre on, on my interview, went up with my father and um, sat in front of this um, Captain Joe, John James and said, and he said to me, tell me about the discovery, Francis. And so I waxed poetic about this thing. And I knew everything about it, even maybe that the third mate's eyes were blue and you name it. And instead of him saying I was fired, I, he said, you're hired. And so I went off down to Plymouth. And this is, this is the um, 
how we dressed and went about our work. It looks very good, but the school was actually in, in an old girls' school in North Road. And we used to have to march through the centre of Plymouth up to the, the North Road school. And uh, quite interesting when we came across the Royal Navy, because of course the Navy officers were going up and down the streets as well, all dressed in uniform. And we were told we had to salute with the Royal Navy. Okay, fine, that's fine. And so we did that until a, a message came from um, on high that uh, the Royal Navy requested no more saluting in, in the town because it was getting embarrassing. Well, we did still stay when we had boat work, we had in the Tamer, of course, ships going in and out there of belonged to the Navy. And we used to enjoy it when we were rowing our lifeboats around because a submarine would come in and to uh, so salute a submarine, you toss the oars in the air. And so we we toss oars in the air with this lifeboat. And of course the submarine, the, the watchkeeper was on the conning tower. So it would tear like hell down to the back end of the ship of the of the submarine, lower the flag, till he gone past, pull it up again, and we just lower off. Well, we had a good old laugh about that. Anyway, um eventually. I got my, um, I, we lasted six months in Plymouth and we were on a sandwich course, so we had to do 12 months at sea. And I went off to Shell Tankers. Oh, before that, in uh, March of the uh, that year, which, um, I'm this belies it, I mean, it was a sunny day, yes, but it was freezing cold. And as soon as I got into this uniform, which we had to buy before we went off to uh, the sea. Uh, I had the photograph taken and then rushed in the house and got changed because it was damn freezing. So off we went to um, uh, Plymouth, uh, to uh, sea, I should say. And Ian Bromley, meanwhile, he had been in Plymouth with me. In fact, we went down on the same train together and uh, I didn't think we were ever going to, uh, we'd never sailed together and I never thought I was going to see him much until he clapped eyes on my sister and he became my brother-in-law. So more of that later. There's the Halcyon, my first ship at sea. And I, I loved it. And I, it was, uh, we went all over the world with that ship. It was an 18,000 ton tanker. And then I was two and a half years in Shell, doing a four year apprenticeship, and they canceled my indentures. And they promoted me to unsubjected third mate. And I thought, oh, that's nice. And so my next job, I was flown out to Singapore. And I went into the office in Singapore and uh, the fellow in the office said, uh, are you prepared to go into a war zone? I said, what? I said, yeah, I suppose so, because it was double pay when you went in there for five days. And so, yeah, okay. And so this is where we ended up. This is the mouth of the Mekong River. And the fleet in, in the Far East uh, was servicing uh, a base quite close to the front line. In fact, the front line was all round us because it was in South Saigon. And the thing about this was why they have the patrol boats going round. They, they've got um, teeth painted on the bow, which frighten the Viet Cong more than anything else. But the reason they're around is because the, the US uh, forces took 50 trusted Vietnamese over to the USA and uh, gave them uh, undermined underwater mines and countermeasure um, underwater mine training how to put limpet mines on ships and everything else and these 50 Vietnamese came back to Vietnam and disappeared into the monks of the Viet Cong and so that these ship, these boats are going around the ship in the anchorage all the time throwing hand grenades around the stern to keep the uh, these underwater divers away the idea was that the ship would come up, um, we were running fuel oil into um, 
in Denave, uh, which is there. Um, because the, the, uh, it was very difficult to um, uh, police the Mekong River with the war going on, what they did was when the, when the ship on the berth had finished discharge, she would be ready to sail and we would be ready to come up the river and we had to pass at 11 o'clock at the widest point in the river and we were both of us were going at full speed up the river and uh, 11 o'clock in the morning of course third mate guess where i was standing on the bridge and one occasion we were going up and we came under fire and the captain and i would you believe it ran out onto the bridge wings as he was shooting until he turned to me he said we're bloody idiots, Francis. Let's get in under the cover of the bridge, quick. And so, needless to say, I survived. We had a few incidents there. We had one ship was sunk on the berth. And um, after six months, I was let off home. So I had a bit of leave. And would you believe, I was sent off to uh, another ship running down to West Africa. And I ended up in the Biafran War. And so I suddenly thought, hang on a minute, Shell must be trying to tell me something about this. Maybe I, they promoted me too early and they want to get rid of me. I have no idea. Anyway, I thought, well, I don't really like tank as much. And I thought I'm going to use my certificate for as much as I can and go to as many different trades as I can. And I will not drop a rank. And I don't care how much I get paid. I'll the other thing is, I'll enjoy myself. So this is what I did. Oh, sorry. And this is where I went. This is a model of the Geese Bay. My first ship in Geese was the Geese Haven. Now Geese ran um, a run from Barry to the West Indies, and uh, loading bananas. It was on a, a government contract because there was a run where they had to bring in 160,000 tons of bananas from the West Indies to the UK every year to keep the island's economy going. And of course, uh, the EU um, came along and decided it was unfair competition. They got rid of the, um, this exclusive um, run. And as a result, Grenada had a civil war St. Vincent became the drug capital of the, of the Caribbean and so on and so forth. So the whole structure just fell to pieces. Anyway, this particular ship is, uh, has a reason I, I put it up. It's actually a model I made um, quite a few years ago now. Uh, the reason has to be this. This young lady I was going out to the West Indies one trip. I was uh, second mate on the 12th war watch. And this young lady was in St. Vincent. Her father was uh, managing director of East West Indies. And the two girls, uh, Kathy and Susie, they used to go out in the summer. They'd been, they'd been educated in uh, Barbados and they went off uh, back to the UK to um, do, and Kathy was doing a secretarial thing and Susie was still in, um, in school, I think, when uh, I met Kathy. And so she came down to the ship once with a tape recorder asking the el electrician to fix it. And the word went round, one of the dog box daughters is, is on board the ship. And so I thought, oh, I'll go and see what she looks like. And so I went into the electrician's cabin um, pretending that uh, one of the deck winches needed attention. And there was this girl. And I like to say love blossomed instantly. But uh, I got back to Barry and I wrote a letter to Kathy and I, um, when she received the letter, she had to try and rack her brain to work out who I was. Anyway, I got back down to West Indies the next trip and it just so happened that she and her mum were traveling home on the ship with us. And so love definitely bottomed then. So one thing led to another and we um, started becoming an item and then we got engaged 
and the plan was we were going to get married in October 1972 in Bristol in Westbury on Trim where their house was. So that was all very well and the reason we had to do that was because mother, my mother had a cerebral hemorrhage and so she couldn't fly. And so it was all set up, yeah we're going to do it in October until come around about August we were on our way out to the West Indies on the Geese Bay, the previous slide. And on the way out, we, were got, we got told we got to lay up in Barbados for 10 days and then go out on charter. Now there was a difference there. Only the master and the chief engineer and the mate and the second mate could take their wives to see one trip to the West Indies. If you're on charter, all officers could take their wives. So I phoned through to St Vincent and said to Kathy, look, we're going to be laid up for uh, 10 days in Barbados. Will you marry me? And then you can come out on the ship with me. She burst into tears. Uh, she passed me over to her mother. Her mother burst into tears, passed me over to her father. Her father said, I'll go and see the bishop. So we went into Barbados and Kathy flew over the 40 minute trip across and came on board and she still didn't say she was going to marry me. And so it was a safe arrival party we were having at lunchtime that day that uh, the radio officer said, well, am I going to marry him or aren't you? She said, oh, I suppose so. So we went off and we crashed out rings in Bridgetown and we thought, oh, we're going to get married in, in Barbados. So Kathy moved into a friend's house there and then the word came from St Vincent, from father-in-law, prospective father-in-law, uh, you have to be resident for five days in St Vincent before you can get married. So the next morning we flew on an early plane over to St Vincent and when we came through immigration, the passport was stamped with the time. I thought that's odd. Anyway, five frantic days later, we were ready to go into Kingstown Cathedral to get married. The night before the wedding, I went down to the father-in-law and I, prospective father-in-law, I went down to the uh, Attorney General's office and said, can we have the marriage license for tomorrow, please? He said, no, nope, you can't have it till 7.30 in the morning, which is when you arrive, five days before. I said, oh my gosh, we were getting married at 9.30 the next morning. And so we're a big panic. We went down to the Attorney General's office in uh, 7.30 hammered on the door, got the certificate, down to the cathedral, gave it to the dean, and said, huh, here you are, okay, back up, got changed, back down, and would you believe we entered the church, it rained. <laughs> and, and it had a tin roof, so uh, you couldn't hear yourself think to start with. Anyway, it was a good marriage. Oh, what am I doing? Uh, there we are, in front of the altar. And there, uh, yes, we got over that one. And here we are to gather company outside. And as you see, none of my family were there because my mother couldn't come to see, come over, obviously couldn't fly. Um, my sisters and what have you couldn't afford it. So I had the officers from the ship to uh, do the honors. And uh, this actually is the, um, the fridge engineer. And we're still in touch with him and we still uh, exchange Christmas cards and hopefully in a couple of years time when we have our 50th wedding anniversary he will be present. And this girl here, the, the other bridesmaid, she is also, um, we see her quite often, uh, she lives down in, in uh, Torquay and Cathy Sitter lives in Barbados which is very handy because we can go out and see her anytime and it, it's rather nice. So we went back, we went into the reception at the uh, the parents house and then off we went to uh, we flew back in the afternoon to Barbados because the ship was sailing that night and we came down on the officers the other officers had come a bit earlier so we came on board the ship and it was dressed over all in flags and there were our names in flags on up, up either side of the main mast and we came on board and the captain he was a Relief captain uh, from Shaw Savile, he said, uh, I don't want to see you for two days, Roger. I said, oh, wonderful captain, but I want to see you on the bridge tonight. I thought, what? So I 
had the whole afternoon sobering up. And the drill was on the bridge at night, um, coming out of uh, Bridgetown. Uh, the ship was there every month. So we had a pilot when the tug was there. So there was a tug to pull the ship off the berth. As soon as that happened, the pilot handed over to the captain and the junior officer then took the pilot down to the tug, waved him off and the tug disappeared and the captain took the ship out. So this time came and the captain was there and I said to him, I'll take the pilot down to the tug. No, he won't, he said. I said, what do you mean, captain? He said, you're taking the ship to sea. I said, what? I, I, hang on a minute, Captain. I, I'm only a second mate. And he said, no, 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 you will. You'll take the ship to sea. So in years to come, when you have grandchildren, you can tell them you took the ship to sea in your wedding day. And I did. And it goes down on record, I think, that that ship left Bridgetown Harbour as the fastest ever departure. We were doing 21 and a half knots coming out of the anchorage. And they had lots of toots on the whistles of all the ships in the anchorage as well. So we went off on charter and we spent a lot of time on charter because I could take Kathy with me. And this is the Geese Cape. Uh, we were eight and a half months on it. We went round the world on that with a, an eventful time in uh, China, which uh, put us in good stead for COVID actually, because we were two months on the coast and unable to uh, go ashore and everything else. And so it, it was uh, it was an interesting time. And the other thing that happened there, uh, in 1974, I took my master's certificate. This is, gives me a bit of a tickled feeling because this particular document is exactly the same as people like uh, Joseph Conrad and people like that would have had. And so it is marvellous. And of course now they've got rid of that and they give you a sort of thing looks a bit more, more like a bus ticket than anything else. Anyway, they gave me a master, uh, a mate's job um, soon afterwards. Um, the company was um, building new ships to replace the fleet of four. And so they ended up with a lot of ships. And as a result, I was sailing as mate on one of the ships, chief officer on the um, one ship, came into Barry and they said, oh, um, we're selling the, the ship, another ship, you'll have to drop down to second mate or go redundant. So I thought, I'll like to chat, chat to Cathy. And I said, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. I'll go redundant. And so I uh, left Geese. And this I put up, it, this is um, the Geese Cape in Cape Town. And it, it's a good uh, farewell picture, I think, for Geese Line. It's a thoroughly enjoyable job, but it was dead men's shoes. I, I think I had to move on. I joined this thing, the Laurentian Forest. This is, uh, I, I was attracted to it because it was short, shortish trip across to Canada and it went, it ran out of Avonmouth. That is until I agreed to join it when it promptly moved to Felixstowe for its home port. And um, it was quite a sophisticated ship. It was an ice class. It wasn't full ice class, but it was ice class enough to cut through six feet of ice. This was very necessary because it was an all weather working ship to run up into the, the Lawrence Seaway in Canada. And um, if you look up on the bow here, that there's those two things there. The, the section of the hull raises up in the air and the same down aft, and then a big ramp comes down onto the berth and then we had our, all our own equipment, straddle carriers and uh, forklift trucks and things like that and we were loading newsprint mainly and forest products and the newsprint was for the Daily Telegraph and the Financial Times and you name it, everything else like that. Um, it was a totally different ball game to me, um, certainly in the winter, I mean you had to have 36 different things you had to do to make sure the ship didn't freeze up in the ice and so on and so forth. Even the um, even the emergency fire pump in the bow thrust, down at the bottom of the bow thrust compartment, in the bottom of the forepeak, that had a, an electric blanket on the battery to make sure it, it would still work. And uh, we did have one occasion where the electrician had forgot to put the trace heating on the sanitary system 
and that was a nightmare. I tell you, we froze up, and we had we were a day in uh, Port Alfred with the doors shut, heating the ship up and heating the pipes up just to get the thing going again. Because they're talking in terms of uh, in the middle of the winter, the temperature would drop down to minus forty. I was walking up the up the deck one day, and and uh, Stephen all came on board. He said, "Morning, mate." He said, "It's warmer today." I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "It's minus thirty-six." I said, "Well." <laughs> And not much different then, is it? So um, the only problem was that with this thing, I mean, and this is in Cape Town actually, because when she went on from charter after I left her, but um, the only problem with the ship is it was all hydraulic and you could easily kill yourself. It became an expert very quickly. Otherwise it was quite for survival. And I was sitting at home one day in Bishop Sutton and I said to, um, I was, just mulling away my time. And the phone rang, can you get over to Rotterdam? Your relief has wound up this forward ramp the wrong way round and the ship is stopped and they can't do it, they can't move it. So I had to go over and sort out this ramp. And then of course they said, well, while you're over here, you might as well stay on board now and do a bit of a trip. And so I got a bit fed up with that and they kept on saying, we're going to make you master and it never happened. And so I, I eventually got, a, I, the only thing that was good about it was the fact it was running into Felix though, where my brother-in-law happened to be on ferries by then. And there is a, a rare picture of us, much later, this is in 2000, I think, uh, because it was my late sister's funeral. And it was the only photograph I think we have of the two of us in uniform, you can tell that uh, Ian by then was working the P&O ferries and they had a better tailor than we had. In fact, that picture prompted me to get another uniform. So I went, to, before I left, um, they, they did have occasions when you got a bit uh, gaga on the Laurentian forest. They used to shove you out on, a, on a, one of the bulk carriers. This is a 75,000 ton bulk carrier. And of course, Cathy came with me. And I'm sure you can all guess what that is. That's the crossing the line ceremony. And I was dressed up as Neptune. And I thought I would be safe from being dunked in the swimming pool, which by then was filthy with uh, galley slop and everything else, which are the usual thing. And I thought, I, I'm, I'm made up here. I, I, they, won't, they won't chuck me in with this get up on. That's the bosun there. As soon as I finished the ceremony, he grabbed me and, and the rest of the crew and they threw me in the pool. So I didn't get away with it. So I left, for, I thought at the end of Harrison's, I'm getting a bit fed up with this. I hunted around for something totally different to do. I went here. Hoveloid. I took my civil aviation license for hovercraft navigator. And um, I spent my summer of 1978 whizzing back and forth across the Ramsgate to Calais at 60 knots. And you're actually doing it in all weather. And your certificate is such that you see this little white line up there. That is the center line of the ramp. And the way you have to take your license is that you fly the hovercraft across blind and you're sitting in the back of the cockpit here behind the radars and the captain's in the front and if you can imagine in fog he's got no view at all and I'm just telling him where to go all the time and so you do that as though you simulate fog of course they could sit out no problem and I must admit it was a hell of a job to do if you're flying the thing up the ramp, just using radar bearings off the building. Anyway, I got it up, up, the, up the white line and, and they gave me a certificate and I spent uh, the next nine months taking 300 odd passengers per trip and 34 cars across to Calais and back. And then at the end of that, they asked me if I'd stay on and get promoted to uh, first officer, flight engineer and go up through the ranks. Unfortunately, I had to give up because um, they've been testing a, a, a French hovercraft 
the engineer Jean Bertin, and it had a static carrier on its VHF. And as I say, when you're talking between the captain and uh, so on, you've got headphones on all the time, uh, airline type standard things. And I couldn't take my headphones off and it did for my right ear and gave me tinnitus. So the surgeon said, you better stop doing that, Roger. So I did. And I went back into the Merchant Navy and it just so happened that the fellow who made me redundant in peace turned round and was the um, personnel man in Stevenson Clark. And so he said, do you want a master's job? Oh, yes, please. Well, come and join us. Well, I didn't actually become master. I was a couple of years as mate because this is a totally different job yet again. This is my first ship, the Burling. I loved it. It showed 4,300 tons of ocean going splendor. We used to run oh, all over Europe and down into the Mediterranean. And um, and the other thing about it, of course, wife and children come too. And that's uh, Rita and Anna. Some of you might recognize them. Anna is now married to a farmer, a dairy farmer in West Penard. And uh, Rita, unfortunately, is upstairs in bed with a, a, a spinal rod and a huge number of problems at the present time, but she's going to recover. So this went on until the last two years of my existence with Stevie Clark. I was on the panel of uh, 10 masters and they said, uh, would you uh, uh, have a look at this? They're going to put a sail on the ship uh, to save fuel. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the end, they put me in charge of the project. And so I went out on this first ship and I, I had two years of it and then uh, towards the end of that, the, the trial had finished. The company was going to flag out the Island Man, and I thought that's time to move on. And I've been making overtures to uh, Hammond pilots, who were um, uh, the deep sea pilots. And so they, uh, I moved off to take my Trinity House deep sea pilot's license. And I was, after I left the Ashington, I thought, oh, that's the wing cells over with. That's a long gone, but they've come back and haunted me all through my existence. And this is in 2013, and that's on uh, Timsbury Lake. And as you see, it, it's still alive and kicking, uh, but that's a totally different story. I was going to join the, uh, well, this man who founded it in 1514. That's Henry VIII, of course. And there is my deep sea pilot certificate. And it's, it's for four areas, so we take it in, in two chunks because it's a huge area. It's from Ushant to the North Cape in Norway and from uh, up into the Baltic entrance and, all, and also off to um, the other, either side of the uh, island and up to the Pendulum Firth and so on. So here is uh, the Trinity House set up. This, this is um, an occasion. There's very few photographs taken in Trinity House. This is the annual court. And uh, the master there is uh, Prince Philip. He was actually being honored because he was the longest served master. And that was actually his 40th year there. And two years later, Princess Anne took over over here. And uh, Prince Andrew is also an elder brother. So he was, I think he just came to the the, the tea and biscuits or whatever. And I, I was a bit annoyed with this when I, I showed the photograph to Kathy and the children because I said, can you spot me there? And they said, yes, you're in the middle. I said, how do you work that out? I said, can you see your bald head? And I thought, oh, that's nice, isn't it? But I'm in the middle because um, I'm two sword lengths away from the table. I have this duty, this ancient duty. As you see, all the elder brethren have swords and they're all gathered down the side and we younger brethren are standing in front and I'm plonked on a spot on the carpet which is two sword lengths away from that table and that's so that if the if the master gets attacked with a sword they can carry on a sword battle in front of the table and nobody's meant to pass me there and actually 
this year is the first year that I haven't been in, obviously been able to do it. We had, we had a virtual course. So, several good reasons for taking a pilot. Additional safety, of course. Uh, the reason being, because these ships are coming, uh, most of them are dog carriers, uh, not dog carriers, container ships, car carriers, largely coming from the Far East and the US um, military sea lift command ship, the equivalent of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. And they've been at sea for a long time uh, with not a lot of traffic. And they, they probably got orders on the bridge saying, do not get closer than two miles for, from another ship and things like that. And they get up into the Dover Straits and they're mortified. Suddenly they're surrounded by ships with, you know, going through the Dover Straits, there's 400 ship movements a day there. And we're working down to half a mile clearance. Um, it's very good to have, and they're very reassured to have one of us on board. Awareness of surrounding, obviously, we, we know exactly where we are. You can drop any pilot on the bridge after a bit of experience. Um, you know, he just looks at the radar and says, well, we're, we're there. Yeah, we know where, we know where we are. And so as a result, we, we can choose the safest course. When you're piloting a ship, you're about half a mile, half an hour, three quarters of an hour ahead. You're thinking ahead all the time, constantly calculating whether you're going to overtake the ship ahead of you or whether one's going to overtake you, and that sort of thing. And you're always plotting, working out all sorts of different connotations of uh, collision avoidance. And so, the ability to choose the safest course is is a boon. For example, if you're taking a container ship up, it, it's better to just go slightly towards the centre of the route, uh, so that um, you're away from the the slower ships, which tend to hug the buoys. The collision avoidance skills, obviously, I mean, we're doing doing it every day, so it, it's obvious that we're going to be pretty good. But if we weren't, then we wouldn't be in the job. And we have familiarity with familiarity with congestion walls. But it, the Dover Straits is our, our backyard, you know, it, it's um, radio reporting. Well, they're supposed to speak English. Um, if you're getting hit with a, a radio re um, report request from uh, Dover Coast Guard, it's clipped very quick. And you've got to be on your, um, we, we even we write it, write it all down so we can just read it out rather than uh, trying to remember it all. And the bottom one is the most important, the crew tiredness. These car carriers, when they come in, they're going up through, they on the bridge for hours on end. You go to Antwerp and then they go to Wanderlaar Pilot Station, which is outside the shell. They're going up the shell, and that's six hours. They're all on standby. They go in through the lock, get alongside, and of course the companies time it so that they can start work as soon as they get alongside. So they're all day loading and discharging cars and they're, they're handling, in Antwerp, they're handling probably around about 3,000 cars in a shift. And so it's hard, hard work. And then well, as soon as they finish, they're on standby, back down the river, another six hours before they get out of one of our pilot station. Then the watch keepers obviously have to carry on and the rest have a bit of a rest, but then they're possibly going off to Southampton or something like that. And so they've done a couple of hours and then they're at it again. And so they quite often, I mean, I, I have occasions where there was a mate will on watch with me after we'd left port. And I looked around and there he was lying fast asleep on the deck. And another time I was talking to, telling a quartermaster port, and uh, I, you would generally give them a course and they reply and then you wait, wait, to, wait to see it happen and then when it didn't happen I looked around at him and I suddenly realized he was fast asleep at the wheel. This is another reason for having a pilot and um, the old question is uh, of course you're meant to reduce speed in fog. What do you do? How do you advise the master? Actually, that, that there is the sun, in case you're wondering, it's not a light. And, uh, well, we say to the masters, look, we're quite happy. We, if you want, you go on to manoeuvring speed, which is slightly below full speed. 
And that means you, if you need to, you can crush the ship into a stop very quickly. Or if you're on a big um, tanker, you, you can turn around very quickly because if you don't stop them. And um, so you say to the master, well, I'm quite happy to go on manoeuvring speed unless conditions get, uh, the um, traffic conditions get worse, and then I will ask you to slow down. Are you happy with that, Captain? He said, yes, okay. Or sometimes they don't. So they say, no, we carry on. And well, that's for you, Captain. This is somebody who should have, <laughs> yes, enough said. And this one is one that happened in the middle of the Dover Straits. A ship called the Tricola. She was loaded with, uh, I think, three, three and a half thousand Porsches and cars such like that. And she overtook another ship in thick fog, too close to the other ship. The other ship had to hold its course. It hold its course, slapped bang into a side door on the port side, and she sank in 40 minutes. The only way to get her out of the Dover Straits was to lift her out piece by piece. So they put her a diamond coated wire that they passed underneath the ship, and they sawed these sections up. And that's the whole section of the ship there complete with the cars inside and everything. And they soared through the prop shaft and the whole lot. And they took it ashore into Zeebrugge and they had huge security around it because the car carrier companies were worried sick that people were going to pinch the parts off the cars and use them. And so they insisted that every car had to be accounted for. So that wreck site was there in the Dover Strait for two and a half years while they cleared up the mess. And while it was lying there, before they started cutting it up, three ships actually hit it. And uh, that was even with a guard ship and boys to market and everything else. And it was astonishing to us how, you know, that one of them was a Turkish tanker. And the bottom line was, this trickler, had she taken a pilot, and it wouldn't have happened because we always passed half a mile clear, which means any ship can turn around within half a mile. Had she taken a pilot, it would cost them about £400. That's one of my more unusual ones I did. That's uh, Richard Branson. And the caption says they've got, he's got an engineer beside him. It's actually um, the fellow who went across, rode across the Atlantic. And so, not quite an engineer. And uh, I was piloting the, the fleet. And it was one of the worst, hardest jobs I could do because of course Richard Branson doesn't listen to anyone. And he certainly wasn't going to listen to me. And, and I have the, that behind him is, is the uh, Dover lifeboat. And uh, as he went up in front of the White Cliffs of Dover, which he wasn't supposed to do, and um, the uh, Dover port and the Coast Guard was shouting at me, get him back, get him back, he's crossing, he's crossing the ferry, get him back. And so I had a huge job getting him back down onto the tractor go across, the right angle run across. Anyway, we did it, and he got the record. He crossed at, uh, it took him about 40 minutes, so it's 18 knots, I suppose, he went across that. That's one of the military sea lift command ships. That's um, a 300 meter long ship. And that actually, it, I did the maiden voyage on that, and she lifted the whole US Fifth Cavalry Division in one lift, all the equipment. And before she came into service, they needed uh, two ships, sometimes three, to do the same job. And up here is a helicopter deck, and it's specially strengthened to take a full helicopter full of uh, commandos and so on and so forth. When we had a, a going down to uh, taking the 5th Cavalry Division, this foredeck here was filled up with 46 tanks and uh, uh, helicopters. That's one of the big 300,000 ton tankers. So I did a 420,000 ton tanker and they found that they were too big. They, they couldn't put them anywhere. And one of them broke down and they have two dry docks in the world to put them in. So 
the, the standard size now is about 300,000 tons for the bigger ship. That's the other way around. And this is one of the ones I did. Um, this is a thing called the Feroza, she's a 180,000 ton loaded bolt carrier. And her rudder fell off in the Indian Ocean. So she came up to, she was allowed to come up. She could just steer, there's a little bit of rudder left at the top. She was able to steer up to Brixham, but the Maritime Coast Guard Agency said she had to have pilots and tugs to take her up to the Dover Strait naturally. And so the whole complex set off, and um, there was another pilot on board here, and I was piloting the tug. This is the um, John Ross. It's the, one of the biggest tugs in the world. It was. Um, it's got a 200 ton bollard full. So we towed it up to Rotterdam. Um, and we had a, a broadcast of warnings every half an hour and so on and so forth, because the whole length of the tow and everything else was 3,000 meters when we were running through the English Channel and then we shortened it down to something around about 1,000 meters for the Dover Strait. And we had a lot of problems with other ships uh, getting in the way and so on and so forth. We got her up to Rotterdam, they discharged the cargo, brought her back down, and she went off to uh, Lisbon dry dock. And oddly enough, um, we left her at Brixham, oddly enough, when she got down to Lisbon dry dock, they made a new rudder in Germany, and it was coming down on the transporter down to the dry dock, and the rudder fell off the transporter. Would you believe it? This was when I did three Carnival cruise liners on the maiden voyages. This was the last one I did, the Carnival Splendor. And this is going into Dover. She was built in Italy. She came up to La Havre and started making passengers. She came up to Dover for her um, naming ceremony, which was with the smiling class. And uh, I piloted her across uh, to Amsterdam and then back to Dover and back up to uh, Copenhagen and then I left because of course the Danish pilot took over. A lovely ship and probably enjoyed myself but I would never want to sail on a cruise liner. It's a cargo full of uh, passengers and the cargo can answer back, that's the thing. So it's much quieter on a, on a normal ship. So this is uh, where we could go off piste a little bit because we had to sort of hastily make these because I usually have these to hand. Now this, this is uh, Port Lodge where you normally hold your History Society meetings. That's 100 scale of Port Lodge. Well, what if we would put it on the Geese, Geese Bay? The Geese Bay wasn't that much bigger ship really. She's 490 meters, uh, 490 feet. So there she is there. This is one of the car carriers going up to, um, to the Bristol Channel, one of the old car carriers, I would say. That's uh, a 200 meter long ship, um, carries about 6,000 cars into Forbury. And so that's what it would look like on there. Now it, it's tempting to put a 300,000 ton tanker up and, and say, well, yes, but that's what it was. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to use a 220,000 ton tanker for a reason which I will um, get to very soon after this. That is the uh, 220,000 ton tanker with Boom Lodge sitting on the foredeck. I suppose you've worked it out. It's the boarding and the landing. That's me coming off a, um, a container ship. I think uh, it's a combination ladder and they're so difficult. We, we're only allowed to climb nine meters on that ladder and the gangway, um, you have to do the rest of it up the gangway and the problem is that when you're coming off in Brixham you're tired and you're walking down the gangway and you, 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 if you don't concentrate you can tell yourself you're going ashore and you can walk off the end of the gangway into the sea because you've got to turn and climb onto the ladder and go on down. You can see that's my baggage coming down separately. That's an easier one, that's going onto a car carrier. And that's in Germany, that's, uh, they, they've got a lot of these now. That, that, that's a, a catamaran, 
and the way they use those, they come alongside, and that there's a little gangway which comes out. You see it, it's just stowed there, and that goes up, up the ladder, and then the lab pilot just climbs up the rest of the ladder. Um, we had a lot of trouble with those when they first came out because the standard boarding speed is six knots. You try doing six knots with these um, catamarans, and we were finding they got stuck alongside. And so we did all sorts of combinations of one going out of style and the other one going out of style and everything else. And, we, and they worked it out over a couple of months. They have to do exactly 10 knots to make them work. And so we had a lot of trouble just to make certain that the ship came down to 10 knots. And then this, these catamarans do 35 knots anyway, so they could whiz alongside. And then when they did discharge their pilot, they could pull away, no trouble at all. And this is something that I best gloss over because I, I did a few of these. We had a helicopter in Cherbourg, and it was all very well if you could land on deck, but I used to keep getting the straw, short straw, and I would be lowered onto a, a, a 300,000 ton tanker because they had deck things on deck and that sort of thing, and there's no space. So I didn't like it at all. I, I used to hang on the end of that wire and say, I wonder when the last the last time it was safe working though was tested. It was, it was very, very thin, and I'm quite a heavy person. So we naturally get dressed up a bit to the board and land, and are not just uh, taken for granted. So there I am in the normal bridge uniform, um, with uh, lace up shoes on, and that's essential. And this is the, the standard boarding off Brixham with a sea safe coat. Now that's a helicopter harness or a harness for uh, pulling you out of the water. They, each, all the pilot boats have a, a little derrick they can lift you out. Uh, cotton gloves, essential for climbing the ladders. Lace up shoes and this is vital, the, uh, the over trousers. Because whatever the weather is like, when the pilot boat goes alongside the ship, there's a little bit of water jets up in between the pilot boat and the ship. You're bound to get your trousers wet. Now the reason that's all slack is uh, because of this. On the right hand side of the coat there is a, an automatic gas cylinder. And that pumps the coat up to a, um, to a life jacket as well. An integral life jacket. I've never used it in anger. Some of the pilots tell me horrifying because this thing has uh, powder in it and the powder has to dissolve which takes four seconds before it fires and by then you're quite deep and so it takes a, about probably 10 seconds before you come up to the surface again and it's a long 10 seconds so I'm told as they never did it. So the, the pool system this is, uh, we, we didn't have to worry what sort of ships we piloted. We did a job, um, whether a car carrier or container ship or whatever. Um, we did the job and we put our bills into Hammond's agent and they paid the ship owners. And they were actually running three months in arrears most of the time. And they had about a quarter of a million pounds outstanding from shipping companies. So we're glad we didn't have to takes up the money. Um, so I can see the time is galloping on a bit so okay. that the answer is no. They're all supposed to speak English. It's a bit weird some of the English but uh, what the, there's the hotel accommodation. That, that's actually on a car carrier, um, Korean car carrier. Two bunks there not because we can take friends. It's um, in the uh, Suez Canal where they have two pilots on board and that's the downside is on some of the old car carriers they didn't have they didn't like having the heating on in the winter and so you had to shiver and freeze and everything else and there was just a just a cold wash wash basin cold tap and you had to go down the alleyway to get a shower and that sort of thing and that was um, with cold water with steam added to it where they juggle around with the controls and everything else, and it was a pain. The other extreme 
this is one of the super tankers, a ship called the Siam, 300,000 tonner. That's the uh, pilot's bedroom, and that's the pilot's day room. And can you imagine, I was on it for a week, I suppose, and you rattle around like a pea in a pod. Very essential to have your stomach change to Teflon. And this is one reason, this is a Korean recipe. Um, I was on a Korean ship and the cook was making this, this is kimchi. And this is, we, we had 25 cases of cabbages came on board and the cook started preparing this uh, kimchi and he put the cabbages in a in dustbins and you see the thing here electrician corners he needed those so he didn't burn his hands and they all the cabbages steep in sea water and then they then go into another process where you add all the chili pepper and the salt and then it's goes on for a couple of days and then it gets drained out and put into plastic containers and served up on the table. One of our pilots described it as blood soaked bandages. If you want the recipe, it, it, you can certainly give me a call, I'll give it to you later on. That's what it looks like from the bridge and the container ship. And that's uh, the inside of the bridge. That's a, that is a, a big tanker, I think. Lots of things to twiddle with. Of course, at night, this is all in darkness, apart from the subdued lighting and all with uh, controls and radars and so on and so forth. That's me doing my thing on a big container ship. I think they had about 10, 12,000 containers on board there. That's what the outlook on your port. That's one of another big ships. And now this is an interesting thing. Uh, I'm standing on a glass deck there, and that's what it looks like. And a lot of pilots are a bit skeptical about that. They think, well, what if it gives way? You know? <laughs> and that's actually the bow wave going along there. And they need that, of course, because when they're berthing alongside, they've got to be able to look down. And uh, with an enclosed bridge, it's very difficult. The, the cruise lines have that as well. Now, to end, uh, we're going to take the 200. 220,000 ton tanker up through the Dover Straits. It's a deep draft ship. And so um, it'll be probably, it was I think about 19 and a half, 20 meters draft, which is kicking around, what, 70, 75 feet. And so a big baby, but uh, not as big as the, the biggest ones. They were 23, 23 and a half meters. So the first thing I have to do is the draft corrections. Nowadays, of course, <laughs> it's all electronic, but um, that was, uh, I always did the chart corrections my, by hand as well as the electronic chart corrections because there's a big problem with the, uh, you, get a, you get the corrections on a disc, you put them in a machine and they correct the chart, but you don't know where they've gone. And so I used to, especially with a deep water route, I used to plot deliberately so we uh, get the order to go to this ship, 220,000 tons. Well, they didn't, didn't know that. We knew the draft and the destination, which was Europort, which was the deep draft terminal in the entrance of the River Mars. So, okay, we're going to set off for Europort. And so six hours before, and now in those days, we had to travel down to Brixham, beyond station six hours before, so I get on the train, go off down there. And then two hours before, we had to be there. The, the ship would call through to the pilot station. It had two hour ETA and they say call back in half an hour. And so in half, in half an hour they call back and so they'd be told to rig the ladder on whichever lee side it was. And we'd set off for the pilot boat. And so we used to go out half an hour before because quite often they'd pick up crabs as well, live crabs. Uh, they had a roaring trade. I mean, Brixham has uh, a trade in live crabs. Um, first to the hotels and then to the pilot boat because they carried oh, hundreds of kilos a week out of the ship. So whiz out, and I'm, that's not in uh, proper uniform. That was uh, when I retired, I think. Um, that was a trip I was doing. We we'll go out to the, um, there we go, out to the ship. That boat does 25 knots. And get on board and that boat whizzes off. And uh, 
when we get on the bridge, just to tell them we've got on board, we give the draft, the destination, and, uh, and arrange when we're going to be back with the ship into Brixton. We put up the signal that that, that pathetic little thing there is the deep draft cylinder. At night it's better because it's, uh, it's three red lights. That's the pilot flag. So we set off up. Now it's a different one from the one you saw before because we have to cross at right angles here and it's all been watched on radar so you can't get away with it. And so we head off down here because there's some shallow bits up here. And so we come on down, cross over, come up into the Dover Straits and here is an abort point. That's so that if there are sand waves developed in the Dover Strait and um, they're surveyed when there's a deep draft ship coming up into Rotterdam, they send out helicopters and do surveys of the bottom just to make sure the sand waves haven't built up um, through northeasterly gales. And um, the ship has to abort, in which case she has to come, come back out down here now and anchor in the Bay of the Seine until the conditions improve. It never happened to me, and I don't think it happened many times. So we're coming up now, going along nicely. Um, I would have had a bit of a rest here. I would have been up for the crossing, and I would have another rest here. The reason that is because this is 12 hours through the Dover Straits, and you don't want to be tired going through the Straits. This is coming up to the first corner uh, off the French coast. That's the Basserelle Boy there. And the reason that's there is because um, you make your report into go into Green A traffic, the French Coast Guard, and from that point on, they do a half hour tracking report of your position, course, and speed. And that is the reason is that because the rest of the ships have to keep out of the way of a deep draft ship. They have total priority in the Dover Strait. So here we are coming up uh, up the French coast, and that boy there is the closest you get. You're half a mile from that in the deep water. And so um, the reason it's half a mile, I keep on about half a mile, is because even a, a super tanker, a, a BLCC, ULCC, they can turn in half a mile. So that's the whole deep water route is laid out. So you always have a, a, a half a mile clearance in deep water so you can turn the ship around because obviously you can't stop it. One of the ships I was, um, I was on a deep draft ship and the, I, I said to him, uh, can you get out of my way please? And he said, uh, can't you slow down? And I said, well, come back in an hour and I'll, I'll, I'll be slowed down a bit if you like. And he said, oh, okay, I'll get around right your <laughs> That's where we're going. We go up through, uh, now this part of it is uh, a separate Sandetti deep water route, which is segregated off four deep draft ships. Um, that's very nice, but then um, you have Russian ships maybe, or some other country. They argue they're fully loaded. They may have 10 meters draft. They're deep draft, of course. And so you, you have these Russian ships come plodding through the Dover Straits ahead of you. And, and we do um, then get hold of Dover Coast Guard and say, hang on a minute, can you get this thing out of the way of us? And so they do uh, tend to shuffle them off. This is the other half of the uh, run up. As you see, uh, we, we're coming up um, this line here. And we're going for that point there, which is the helicopter boarding point. And we, uh, we have to be on time there, obviously. So what we do is we, we run up fairly fast up into this bit. And then from here on up, we're starting to back pedal to make certain that our ETA is dead on the helicopter one, because the helicopter just can't hang around. And at this point here, um, I'm back on the bridge and we ring half a head on the engine because that is the distance it takes to get up to the six knots boarding uh, speed again for the helicopter. 
this uh, you see on this chart, there's a bit of paper in here that, uh, that that's a block correction. When they have big corrections for charts, they put in a block correction rather than making you draw them all out with pen and ink. And so that block correction was put in because of something I did. Um, just toward the end of my time, I was working on the UK Safety Navigation Committee and I was uh, responsible for traffic routing and so on. And we had a big problem with this part here because this is a, a big crossing point, uh, 11,000 crossings in a year. And there was a big problem of um, near collisions and collisions because the ship's coming round the light ship here, going down into the Dover Straits, were blocked from coming through because the ship's piling down past them. And so it was a huge sticking point that it had been tried once and the IMO had thrown it out. And I was doodling away one day and I thought, why don't we swing the route a mile to the west and get a wedge shape in there, which is what we did. And sure enough, it worked. And uh, it's, it's one of the reasons I got my Charter Masters certificate. So we're coming up now, that's um, going past Catherine A, that's the radar picture. Lots of ships, it's quite exciting. There are ferries. And this is uh, a bit of a cheat out. This is actually a container ship coming down from Felixstowe. So it just shows you what sort of thing you're getting into. I mean, that's all these uh, tails are ships going along and, and we're joining this route here. In fact, we're joining on this side where this ship is going. Um, you might think, oh, God, we're, we're going to hit something here somewhere. Uh, but actually, in fact, we're perfectly safe and clear to go through on that, that track. And this is another one that uh, was a bit dodgy um, through the eye. But in actual fact, that, that's the predict, that is the predicted where she's going to be with us there. But he knew and I knew that when we got to that boy, we were going to hold the course to the north. And so he actually passed about a mile behind us. This is one that made a bit of a mistake because he went, uh, he, oh, we think he holds a course on his waypoint that he put in electronically because uh, he was within a couple of minutes of running aground on the East Dyke bank. And that was a, a, a very big um, container ship, the company we will not mention. And somebody had to tell him, where do you think you're going? And, and he said, oh my gosh. And, and he went back into the roof. That's the wind farm off Margate. I had a hand in putting that in too. And so we're coming up now to, towards the end and we get to the pilot station and the helicopter comes out and lands on board. And when we're getting the helicopter, the helicopter is controlled. Um, I stay in charge of the con until the helicopter comes on board and indeed until the pilots set up the equipment. And then I take over, I hand over to them and they say, yeah, we're happy. And so we turn to the captain and say, right, the other pilots are taking over the captain and I go off to bed, ready for the trip out. That ship we have taken through the Dover Straits is this one, a very nice ship. I was choice pilot for it and I had some very happy trips on it. She was known as the Sea River Mediterranean then, but she'd had an unfortunate accident in the past. And she used to be known as an Exxon Valdez. Mm. My story started with a book and it ends with a book. This is a, a book called, uh, the first book of course was the, um, where there was a pilot on the page. This is Light of, on the Waters. This is the Trinity House 500th anniversary book, the history of Trinity House. There is a pilot on board, on the, a, a picture of a pilot doing his work on the ship's bridge in the pages. And this time, the pilot is me. Thank you very much. So Thank I you, Roger. Fascinating. I, th I think I'll stick to my narrowboat on the canals. I think. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, does anybody have some questions? If any questions of Roger, please do use your raise your hand thing at the bottom of the um, screen. 
either in the chat. I think if you, you go into chat, you have an opportunity to raise your hand. Or maybe I'll just unmute people. Hang on. Paul's raising his hand, is he? Ah. Oh, has he? Oh, right. I missed him. Sorry. Either his hand or his foot. I can't see any hands being raised. Let me unmute people. Right, you can all unmute yourselves if you have a question. Oh, we've got some hands. Olive, yes. Olive, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? I was going to say, if you want to raise your hand, you go into the participants, click click on the participants down bottom left. Oh, it's there, is it? Okay, thank you. And, and the raise hand is in there. So I'll lower my hand now, because that was all I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so, seriously, though, so, some of those pictures of the, the radar pictures of the boats, the ships on the... Uh, in the Dover Straits and through the channel, you know, um, dr driving it high full speed in reverse down a motorway sort of um, <laughs> came to mind kind of thing. <laughs> yes, it's something like that. <laughs> <laughs> because your brain is 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 a, an, an ongoing computer. You're you're calculating speeds and distances and angles and what have you and and. Uh, it's essential you have a, a good grounding in maths, I think, for that. Um, I was yes. work, working things out. And, and one of the things I learned from the hovercraft, uh, they, they taught you to be able to handle two or three VHF conversations at the same time. And so that was brilliant when I got around to uh, piloting because, um, you know, you could be talking to the captain. I mean, they had a terrible hazard sucking in when, when you were trying to concentrate. Uh, and you could be talking to the captain and, and you'd hear something on the radio and think, oh, yeah, I don't think about that. And um, quite a few times, I'd say, excuse me, captain, I'd just go onto the phone, I'd sort of talk on the phone and he'd say, oh, I didn't hear that. I said, no. <laughs> I did. Oh, you 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 were you have got your hand up. You unmute yourself. That's it. Yeah. Paul. Oh yes. Uh, as your neighbour, Roger, I have to say I found that the most <laughs> interesting talk, and uh, I've learned an awful lot about my neighbour, and that was fascinating. Um, I was very interested in the um, the wind sail that you were showing, and um, you know what do you think is the uh, development progress uh, for, for wind assisted sailing in the next um, few years given all the greenery that's around nowadays I imagine it's uh, it's something that people will look at very seriously oh yes yes and it, it, it's, it's it's mushrooming I would say at, at the moment and um, as you know I'm uh, Kathy and I bought the wing sail company uh, in the last couple of months and um, I am actually going back on to Kingsbury Lake to uh, carry out the remainder of the tests on that uh, particular ship and then we're linked in with a, a company in Singapore that uh, is probably going to take them to sea and uh, that, that's probably going to save, with the wind blowing of course, it's probably going to save about 15% uh, of the fuel, something like that. Oh, that so seems brilliant. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah. A, a lot of the uh, designs are coming out, and and uh, I'm also in touch with the Maritime Coast Guard Agency because um, a lot of them are saying, "Oh yes, we can put sails on on top of the deck and everything," and and they're sticking them on, and they they say um, when you I'm in the in International Wing Sail Association, he's telling me that. When they ask them about navigation and so on and so forth, they say, "Oh, yeah, well, you can see see easily from the bridge and so on." And they're missing the point because the main mast navigation light is often stuck behind one of the sails, and so it's totally contravening the collision regulations. 
So, as I say, the man has just got AIDS here looking into it at the moment. <laughs> uh, so, I, I can honestly say our wings failed, doesn't it? It is a problem that you know, you've, you've got, I think it's in most industries, isn't it, that um, the people take over who look to the um, the obvious gains and so on and so forth. Oh, yeah, when you have a sale, stone so high, then yeah, that, that's better. And they, they overlook the basic. And so something like that, where you block off a, um, one of the navigation lights, it's essential that you have to see it. And it's in the collision regulations that they have to be clearly seen. So you could end up with a situation where if you're crossing a sh that particular ship going off on the port side and you're on a steady bearing, a collision course bearing with the sail in line, then you're not going to see that light. And so you're actually looking at a single white light before you see the side light. And you're, going to, you're only meant to see the side light two miles off. If you see the one single light, that is, you're supposed to assume that you're overtaking the other ship. So you can imagine what sort of consequences that will happen when you suddenly see the main mast light appear out of them. And there you are about to bother into the thing. And they clearly need a pilot's insight to get that right. Well, yes, I mean, they, but, but the trouble is, I mean, the um, people are masters at sea, and um, they're, they're very short for flight. Charles, you had your hand up there. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I just wanted to ask Roger if how Brexit will affect um, the work of pilots, because, I mean, you talked about operating out of Sherbrooke. Yeah. Is that something that will change post uh, uh, 31st of December? No, no. Um, the, the whole maritime set, section has sort of gone round Brexit and, and they're, they're, they're just carrying on business as usual. It, it, it's so international, the maritime sector, that uh, it just wouldn't happen. You know, it, it's, the whole thing is linked in with different countries and so on and so forth. So, yes. It's great. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Katie, would you like to unmute yourself? You've got your hand up there. Uh, it's, it's me, actually. It's David. Oh, sorry. No, not, not, not to worry, not to worry. Uh, Roger gave a very, uh, very... Uh, Roger gave a very, very... Uh, Roger gave a very convincing account Roger of a very convincing a career of that, that was career extremely as well as rewarding. If you were presented with a 14, 15-year-old today who enjoyed sailing and, and swimming and so on, would he recommend this career now for, for, for someone who's going to be pursuing it over the next 20, 30, 40 years? Oh, I think, yes, I think so. It, it's, um, now's the time to get into it, basically, because you know, there, there's still a lot of, um, a lot of very useful jobs happening. Um, the, a, a colleague of mine is, um, he just, I think he's just stood down now as chairman of the Mercury Navy Training Board and he was tasked with the responsibility of bringing the um, numbers up um, uh, because we need about 2,000 a year to go into uh -huh. training and uh -huh. we're still now bopping around about 700 or something like that. Right, right. And um, yes, it, it's, um, it's certainly quite a rewarding profession and I, I can I can still fully recommend. I, I have four mentees myself. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a liveryman with the Honourable Company of Master Mariners and um, we have a, a mentoring scheme. And I have four mentees. One of them is, is um, a, a skipper on a, one of the slips that pubs in, in Portbury. Um, another one is uh, delivering uh, tugs uh, in Hull. Another one went off and he was doing uh, wreck recovery work and I put on my ears now. And another one's off around the world on a um with Musk um tanker. So yes it it's there's plenty of work out there and the only trouble is of course up until recently, I think even now, um the first jobs that the cadets had were on cruise liners. <laughs> yes. And I I explained to them well yeah if if you want to do anything, just get off the cruise liners. <laughs> Good. Thank you.
Jackie yeah. Martin, you have a question. Hi, oh, yes. Hello, there, Roger. First of all, thank you ever so much indeed. It was a great talk. And it's really good. I realised I really knew about your work. One of the things I thought I did know, though, was it took a long, long time for tankers to turn around. Now, in your half a mile room, and what kind of turn are you doing in half a mile? Could you talk to us a bit about the turn? Well, yes. I mean, th th this is the thing. Um, you obviously don't try and stop them because they, they take 12, 14, 15 miles to stop. But um, sure. there's no point. If, if you if you put them in the middle of the turn, it's the quickest and easiest way of doing it. The only problem is when you turn them at full speed, they do the turn within the half a mile, yes. Um, but, but by the time they come back on course, uh, they've dropped down probably from 13 knots down to six knots and that then takes about an hour and a half to build up speed again and of course if you're going for a helicopter rendezvous that's the last thing you want to happen and also with your round turn you've lost a lot of distance so you know it, it's a double whammy basically so we, we don't like doing it I, i've only done it once i think and I, I only started going sort of halfway round and, and then the other ships for a reason and then all decided to come back again. <laughs> all right. But, uh, yes, it, it's, it's, it's not to be recommended, like I say, being for ETA purposes. Okay, anybody? Oh, yes, Katie, you can, Dave, if you come back again, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, um, so this is a question from Katie on this ah. occasion. So, <laughs> <Well done. laughs> um, I was all the way through listening to your talk, I couldn't get the, the line from Gilbert and Sullivan out of my mind, which is the importance of the distinction between a pilot and a pirate. Um, <laughs> and it's obviously been a, an issue much covered in, in the press in recent years about uh, piracy and, and modern piracy at sea. So I just wondered if you think what experience you've had of that and whether you still see it as a growing issue for you know people that you're mentoring and, and what the career will be like in the future well uh piracy is still a huge huge problem yes uh, i was reading about um the singapore straits they're, they're having massive trouble down there um they have about 38 incidents in in a year and in, in, the, in the singapore straits and well, the other day they had uh, um, three in two and a half hours. Mm. Oh, gosh. So yes, it is a huge problem, and also it dies away in one part, and then comes up another part. I mean, Somalia was the one that was mm. always on people's minds, and that was serious because they had seven hundred odd um, uh, crew in in captivity in in Somalia at one stage, mm. and they. If they put on um, uh, marshals on the ships, uh, which were supposed to solve the problem, but then uh, yeah, they, they started attacking the marshals and starting using guns and things like that. So um, they got taken off, and then they started creating citadels on the ship, which um, all the crew could go into and lock themselves in. Mm -hmm. And that was okay until the Somali pirates came out with one of the people, one of the officers they had ashore and said they would kill him unless they came out. And so it really got nasty. And uh, mm -hmm. and now at the moment, uh, West Africa is the one that's um, mm -hmm. troubling up again. But that one that uh, when it came into the UK, that was uh, recently, that that wasn't actually piracy. I know it, they put on the news it was piracy. It was seven stowaways apparently, and, and they've been to, they tried to get into Spain. And there is an international law which says, you know, if the country you go to, they're supposed to you, uh, take them off. Uh, they're not meant to keep them on the ship. And Spain refused to land them and sent the ship away. And then they went to France. France did the same thing. And so the, the third time they came up to the UK, and, and it was in desperation really that the um, uh, they were actually out on deck, these, um, these stowaways, and, and the captain was safely locked in the wheelhouse and the chief engineer was locked in the engine room. And so you know, it, it was sl slightly different from what uh, came out on news. Mm. 
Mm. But yes, it is a huge problem. But uh, uh, yeah, we've just got to deal with it. Uh, it's one of these things that happen. Martin you. and Jackie, you got another one? Well, I'm not trying to cut down any more questions, but I did just want to make sure that I said a really big thank you on behalf of the um, History Society, really, um, to Roger for agreeing to do the talk and to Andrew and Julie, who I know put lots of time into sorting out the actual presentation for tonight. And it's really great to see just so many people on the list. And well, we had we had, th had 30 at one point, Jackie. Yeah, a lot of those are couples, aren't they? So yeah. Um, really good and nice to see not just our old members but some new people who hopefully you'll stay with us in the future. So big thank you Roger. Thank you very much Kathy. Good evening. It's been a pleasure. Great. Any final questions from anybody? No? Right. Okay. Well I think there's thank you from me Roger as well echoing Jackie's thoughts and uh, we seem to have managed to uh, survive the technology. <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> I was close one thing. <laughs>